mm-hmm. then it's going to be a subgroup of that maximal order. And then goes about properly to show that such a thing exists. Okay. And Rotman does not do that. <laughs> <laughs> He says that it's one of maximal order, which necess- not, isn't necessarily the biggest power of the prime which divides. Then he proves a lemma, a theorem, a corollary, a theorem, and then has a theorem that says there exists a subgroup of that maximal order, a p to the biggest possible power of, that fits into the order of the group. Mm-hmm. And there's certainly an argument for doing it that way, but it's, I'll say it's, of the different ways I've looked at it, it's not my preferred way of proving it. Um, does, uh, Rotman doesn't get three, of, I mean, there are three solo theorems I've seen in some books. Uh, I guess Hungerford has three. Yeah, so he doesn't number them one, two, three, and I'm not sure what the numbering is. Mm-hmm. One of my other references, number one is that a Celo subgroup exists. Yeah. And two and three, that author put together, one of them says that all of the Celo P subgroups are conjugate. And the other one tells you how many conjugates there are. Yeah, number of uh, solo groups that divide the order. Right, and it's congruent to one mod P to the E or something. Congruent to one mod P. Yeah. So, like the first theorem that's... Rotman proves, I think, is CELO 2 and 3. So theorem 5.34, Okay. I think is CELO 2 and 3. And I think maybe that 5.36 is CELO 1. Hmm. Or maybe that's 5.38. Either 536 or 5. 536 says if a CELO subgroup exists, then it has order P to the E. And I think 38 says that G actually has a subgroup of order P to the E. Yeah. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He gives a lot of examples, doesn't he? I mean, not um, examples, maybe. The propositions here look like examples. He has some. I wouldn't say that it's as many as I see other places. Mm -hmm. But he has a very extended example at the end of the chapter about unit triangular matrices. And the big payoff there is that Every finite P group is isomorphic to a subgroup of some unitriangular group. So that feels like kind of an analogy to, was it Cayley's theorem? That said that every group is a subgroup of a permutation group? It's isomorphic to a subgroup of a permutation group. Mm, it was not Kaylee, maybe it's something else. Yeah, we've seen that. Yeah, it was some, something we saw recently. Those permutation groups are enormous. <laughs> yeah. It, these unitriangular groups are much smaller. Mm-hmm. So it's it's saying that we can put P groups instead of putting the saying, oh, look, they're isomorphic to a subgroup of something enormous saying that it's isomorphic to a subgroup of something that's smaller. Mm-hmm. Which I guess is a good thing. Okay. 
at, at least it helps justify why you might be interested in these unitriangular groups other than just as examples of silo groups, silo mm -hmm. groups. Okay. Yep. Um, hello, Jir. Um, I guess Hearn said he will join too. I'm not sure. Cool. I'm ready to step back and let you start whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to go to our Rothman and we'll see how far we can make to this. Um, the unit triangular matrix matrices. I'm not sure what he's doing with those. Um, but yeah, he spends around three to four pages on those things. Okay, so we'll get to first uh, the proofs of the theorems and then we'll see how we can um, go far with it. Yeah, give me a second. Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, let's see. I guess her would join, or maybe not. Um, yeah. So, um, it's a little theorems again. So we did last time. Um, the fundamental theorem of abelian groups, uh, the base theorem, sorry, the basis theorem, and stuff like that. Um, this time we're going for non abelian groups, and this is one of like the important things you have to do in group theory um, the silo theorems. Okay, so. Um, I believe we're going through Rotman, so you know we'll have to follow his terminology and whatever he says. Um, simple group, if you remember what it is, um, it's just a group whose normal subgroups are just the unit group, sorry, the unit and the um, group itself, the identity and the group itself. All right, and um, yeah. So, um, so he first defines uh, what a P, uh, silo P subgroup is. So if we have a prime, the silo P subgroup of a finite group is a maximal P subgroup um, of that group, right? So here the maximal um, word means that, you know, if you have um, any other P subgroup, of the finite group G, then it's going to be um, then it's going to always either be like a contained within P or it's going to be equal to P, right? So it's the maximal um, P subgroup, right? And uh, Lagrange theorem uh, for the you know order of the subgroup and the um, group. Uh, we can say that um, if p to the e is the largest power of p that divides the order of g, uh, then a subgroup of order p to the e uh, must uh, exist, right? And that will be, uh, I mean, if it exists, uh, then it's going to be a maximal um, p subgroup of um, g because it's the largest power um, of the prime that divides the order of g, right? 
Okay. So, um... Alright, so then, um, he goes on to say how, um, like, peace subgroups are always going to exist, right? So, if you have, like, um, any peace subgroup of G that is S, and then there exists uh, a silo peace subgroup P, uh, containing S, so it contains S. So, if there is no peace subgroup strictly containing S, then S itself is going to be the silo subgroup. A silo P subgroup. Um, otherwise, you're going to have a P subgroup that contains S, right? So if um, you can show that uh, there is a subgroup, that P subgroup that contains S, and P that subgroup is maximal, so P1 is maximal, then it's going to be silo, right? So that's um, how we're going to think about these P subgroups and how they're going to be silo P subgroups. Um, so we know about uh, the conjugate, uh, we know the normalizer and the um, um, centralizer, right? Um, and this is directly from um, the index of the normal subgroup. So this is the normal normalizer um, and um, if um, the normalizer that you're taking of a subgroup is of is of a finite subgroup, then the number of conjugates of the subgroup is going to be the this, right? And we saw the um, what was that? The class uh, formula and stuff like that uh, in our first lecture of uh, group actions and things like that. So um, it follows from there. Um, if your H is a normal subgroup of the norm of the normalizer, and then the quotient of the normalizer with the uh, subgroup H um, is going to be defined, uh, well defined because it's a normal subgroup. So first lemma, we're going to see this lemma, and then we'll uh, get to uh, one of these silo theorems, right? So the first lemma says uh, if you have a um, silo P subgroup of a finite group G, then uh, first uh, every conjugate of these P subgroup, silo P subgroup, is also going to be the same. It's going to be silo uh, P subgroup of G. Uh, then if you take the normal normalizer of the this P -low C, sorry silo P subgroup um, and mod out with P the same uh, subgroup uh, P subgroup, then uh, that's going to be prime its order is going to be prime to uh, P. So, you know, the order of the quotient uh, group is going to be pri relatively prime to the um, prime P that we took for the P subgroup. Um, if uh, you have an element A in G and has some order, uh, sorry, its order is some power of P um, and if the conjugate um, um, of P with respect, and if A P A inverse like the conjugate is equal to uh, P itself, then A is also going to be in the um, silo group subgroup, right? Okay, so we have to prove um, these three things. After that, we have the first uh, silo theorem. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot of. Um, stuff. Um, it's not really that um, complicated. It's just like trying to repeatedly um, count things. Yeah, the order on the um, the order essentially. Okay, so let's see. Uh, okay, so the first statement is that every conjugate of P is also solo P subgroup. So uh, you take an element from G, you take the conjugate with respect to that element. Um, so, you know, if um, the conjugate is always going to be a P subgroup of G, right, that is, um, that is like, um, straightforward. If you remember what a P subgroup is, um, mm-hmm. 
so we defined p groups and p subgroups before uh, I'll go a bit up but I think um, it's, it's um, straightforward uh, you just have um, the order prime but um, so your conjugate is going to be a p subgroup of G but it's not maximal um, so you have to show that it is maximal and then you're done um, so if it is not a maximal p subgroup then there is uh, going to be another p subgroup which will contain uh, the conjugate um, hence um, you know these p the p group itself the silo p subgroup itself is going to be contained within the conjugate of q right because q contains uh, the conjugate of p so conjugate of q is going to contain p right um, but that's not possible because p is a silo p subgroup uh, which means it's maximal right so that was by contradiction a proof of the first statement so every conjugate is going to be um, a silo p subgroup all right um the second one um that's also a bit tricky but let's see so you are taking the mod of um the normalizer um the normalizer of the um silo subgroup and you're modding it out with the same thing and then taking the order of that um, now, if P divides um, the order of this uh, quotient group, then uh, if you remember Cauchy's theorem, so Cauchy's theorem uh, shows that um, it the, this quotient group must contain an element, um, this coset AP, whose order is P, right? So that was Cauchy's theorem, which we did uh, again on the first lecture of advanced group theory on group actions, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, the quotient group contains uh, these cosets of order P, um, then, um, you know, this quotient group must contain a subgroup, which is, which is uh, like uh, the cyclic group of uh, this coset. So this is a cyclic group generated by this coset, and its order is P, right? Now, if you remember the correspondence theorem, uh, we are going to have a subgroup S. So this is S, uh, S uh, star. Um, so there has to be a subgroup S uh, which will contain P, right? Which will contain the uh, silo subgroup that we're working with, um, and it's going to be contained within the um, normalizer, right? Normalizer of P. Uh, so you know. We there must exist um, such a subgroup because of the um, correspondence theorem, um, and and you know if you have that, then S mod P is going to be isomorphic to S star, just because you know you can have isomorphism um, between S mod P to a star by the correspondence theorem directly. So, yeah. Okay, so um, la once you can like make this isomorphic, um, uh, you see that like S itself is a P subgroup of the normalizer um, because the normalizer itself is like um, a subgroup of G, but I believe he again gives this as an exercise 2.75. That is um, 2. Sorry, 5.27, no. Okay, 2.75, okay, that was like in chapter 2. Um, we haven't done that, but I believe 2.75 is about... Um, yeah, let's see if it's actually an important um, exercise or theorem, whatever. Two point seven let G be a finite group. Um, P is a prime, H is a normal subgroup of G, prove that if, ah, oh, okay, I think we've done this, or something similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Order of V is the product of the orders of H and G mod H. 
Ya. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 280, I guess. Uh, okay, so we are we were here. So um, this uh, S is a P subgroup of the normalizer, um, which is strictly larger than P, and this contradicts the maximality of P, right? Because P is a slow P subgroup. So yeah. So what that means by contradiction is that P cannot divide this. Um, order of the quotient okay um third one is um about um the conjugate i mean if you have the conjugate is equal to this little group then um the element that you're taking conjugate conjugate respect with respect to is going to be in the subgroup silver subgroup um okay so um by definition of the normalizer if you remember the element um a must um if you're taking an, ele an element of um from g the element a has to lie in the um normalizer because you know the conjugate is uh, essentially equal to the group p itself um so the element uh, is in here now if a is not in the p silo p group p subgroup then the coset a p um is going to be a non trivial element of this ah uh, if a is not an element of the silo subgroup then the coset of a p is a non trivial element of um, this. Okay. Right, I mean, of course, if A is going to be in P, then um, um, this coset is going to be in the um, trivial identity itself because you're taking the mod with respect to P. Okay. Um, having some order of power p, so okay, so no, it's a non-trivial element and has some order of, of power p. Um, so okay, and um, from part two, we know that uh, you know if um, the order of this is going to be prime to p, so you know, p cannot divide it. So um, by Lagrange theorem. Um, this is impossible because um, hmm, because if you have some order of um, sorry order as to some power of p, then it it is going to divide right. Uh, the uh, p will divide the order of the quotient group, and uh, that's um, impossible because of the prime, right? So yeah. Mm, okay, so I guess that makes sense. Um, so okay, you know we'll see the first uh, Scylla group at least in um, Rotman. Um, in other books, I believe it's different. I haven't checked Artin though. Artin, I believe, does it a bit differently. Uh, hello, Hern. Right, so for Artin, this is the first civil theorem. Hmm. Right, so he has three. 
um, we'll see them in Rotman. Okay, so the first theorem says that um, you have a finite group uh, of order um, this. So essentially, this is just the primary decomposition, sorry, prime decomposition of the order of G, right? So you have um, T primes and uh, their exponents. And you have a silo P subgroup of G um, for some um, of some prime P, which is equal to, like, you pick out a prime from here and you uh, have a silo P subgroup from there. And um, the theorem says that every silo P subgroup is going to be conjugate to P, so it looks a lot like this. Um, and the second one says that if there are um, Rj uh, silo subgroups, then Rj is going to divide um, the order of G um, divided by ah uh, the exponent. Okay, so if you have like a specific number of silo P subgroups. Uh, generated by this um, uh, specific prime pj, then uh, the number of silo p groups is going to divide uh, this thing, right? So rj is congruent to 1 mod uh, pj. Okay. Okay, so the proof looks quite long. Um, we'll see if we can go down. Um, but yeah. Okay, so let's see. You have x. Um, which is the set of all conjugates of P, right? So um, you have Rj conjugates of P, and you have them in a set X. Um, so okay. So P, this uh, silo P subgroup that we're taking, is the first element in the set. So that's P1. Um, so if you consider another silo P subgroup uh, like Q, um, then you know Q is going to act on the set of conjugates uh, by conjugation, right? So that's group action. Remember. Uh, so if you have an element from Q, then um, it sends something like this. So P i is equal to um, the conjugate with with respect to some G i, right? And that gets mapped to um, A, right? So this is like if you have a conjugate from X, you map that uh, conjugate, and you like have another conjugate of the conjugate, right? <laughs> With respect to A, so you have um, A um, times this thing, and then taking conjugate again, right? A inverse. So um, this works out to be like this. So now you're taking. Um, the conjugate of P with respect to AGI, right? And this is again going to be an element of X because X contains all the conjugates of P, and this is a conjugate of P, right? So that's uh, the group action you have on the set X, right? By corollary 2.99, 2.99, uh, the number of elements in any orbit is a divisor of uh, mod Q. Okay, we have done that when we were discussing about orbits. Um, you know, so that is every orbit um, has uh, like the the cardinality um, of the orbit um, is going to be some power of p, okay? And that's because q is a p group. Okay, okay. So if we go ahead. Uh, so if uh, we're going to have an orbit of um, size 1, right, so you have just one element, then uh, there is going to be some pi uh, such that its conjugate is going to be the same uh, thing in itself, right, for all the elements in the set Q. Um, when you take the conjugate, you're going to get the same, hmm, 
same thing back okay a bilemma of 5.33 uh, just what we did above um, right um, it says that we have uh, an element from PI so this is confusing because he's using the same element a in Q and in PI for some reason so a is in PI uh, and for all a in Q okay okay so you're t he's taking a subset okay so Q is a subset of this PI um, but as Q is a silo P subgroup it has to be maximal right it's a maximal P subgroup that means Q and PI have to be equal right that was the uh, definition of maximal um, P subgroup that is the silo um, some group now um, if Q is equal to P1 so that is P1 is the first element in X that we're considering uh, then um, you know the only orbit that you're going to get of size 1 um, is going to be um, the set P1 itself right so um, if you're going to consider the orbit of X um with respect to this group action um going to get just p1 okay that is when q is equal to p1 okay makes sense now we conclude that uh the mod of x uh the order of x um sorry the cardinality of x is equal to rj right that's how many conjugates we have taken and that is equal to a one mod p that is uh it's um not divisible <sighs> that is it leaves uh the remainder one when it's divided by p exactly right so yeah okay now for the um, this part of the theorem we have to show that okay so if you take um, like some slow subgroup that is not a conjugate of P right here it was a conjugate um, you know you have the conjugation but so it's not a conjugate of P thus Q cannot be equal to PI right um, for any um, element in the set X now if you again have the group action on X and again we ask if there is an orbit of size 1 say some PK containing right I mean if you have an orbit of size 1 it's going to just contain one of the um, conjugates of P right so let's say that's the PK uh, conjugate um, that means if you have something like that then Q is going to be equal to that right um but okay but again as we assume that q is not a conjugate of p so q cannot be in x because x contains all the conjugates of p um so that's not happening thus uh you know you're not going to have orbits of um unit size or you know without they cannot have just one element um so that means each orbit has size and honest power of p okay and it follows that the cardinality of x is equal to rj is a multiple of p that is an rj is congruent to 0 mod p which contradicts the congruence uh, we concluded here right so therefore there is no such silo p subgroup that is not a conjugate of p right so every silo p subgroup is going to be a conjugate of this um, p right yeah so and from there it's just a matter of applying the um, um, class formula and you know stuff like that so rj is equal to um, this with respect to the uh, normalizer we just did that in um, 
um, yeah but okay so um, RJ is going to be divisor of uh, order of G right but RJ uh, is uh, one more PJ right that's P um, which implies that the GCD of uh, RJ with uh, the prime taken to some exponent is going to be always one so you know you, you apply you Euclid's lemma of um, division uh, sorry the fact that like um, the GCD is one right so the order of G when you like divide that by PJ uh, that's going to be divisible by RJ okay so because RJ device uh, the order of G right so yeah so that was the first silo theorem yeah. makes sense this time okay hmm so we have a corollary and then we have the other silo theorem so this corollary says that a finite group um, has a unique silo subgroup P for some prime P if and only if the subgroup that you're taking is normal with respect to the finite group G right uh, and the proof is kind of straightforward so if you have P as a silo P subgroup of G um, that's unique um, then uh, if you try to have the conjugate of P that is A P A inverse um, by the proof that we just did is also going to be a silo P subgroup um, but um, as it's unique um, so the conjugate has to be equal to P itself right so every time you have a silo P subgroup um, you know for some specific prime P um, it has to be unique for that prime right um, so what that means is that um, for all the A's in G for all the elements in the group um, P is going to be a normal subgroup of G because it contains all the uh, conjugates generated by A that is all the conjugates of P and um, I mean they are P themselves itself so um, it's going to be normal now conversely if you assume that P is, is a normal subgroup of G um, then um, you try to have another silo P subgroup Q then you can if you, you try to say that like Q is a conjugate of P so Q is equal to some A P A inverse um, but uh, A P A inverse is going to be P uh, by normality because you know P is the normal subgroup so it contains the conjugates um, that means P has to be Q because Q is a silo P subgroup so it's maximum um, it cannot be contained within anything but uh, it, ha it has to be equal to that thing right? so Q is equal to P and this is uh, a very interesting I believe useful corollary because once you have a normality you get a free um, you know two-sided um, condition right so if you have a normal subgroup of a finite group um, you can have um, unique silo subgroups for um, primes P right okay okay so um, we have the next theorem uh, which says that if G is a finite group of order P to the E M right so you have some multiple um, of this so P is a prime and M is of course uh, it's on uh, it's not divisible by P okay um, then every silo P subgroup um, of this finite group is going to have order P to the end this is um, doesn't look that difficult to me but yeah P does not divide uh, the index of um, P right so the prime does not divide the index of the uh, silo P subgroup right um, now the index of this is equal to the index of the normalizer 
times the index of the p with respect to the normalizer because p is a subgroup of the normalizer, right? Um, so uh, the first factor, okay. So this thing. Um, so assume that to be R, so that's the number of conjugates of P in G, exactly. Um, so, right, so P does not divide uh, this because R is always going to be one more P, we've seen that, um, we've seen how that works. Now this second factor that you have here, um, this is equal to uh, the order of the quotient group we saw on lemma 5.33, remember, uh, which is also not divisible by p, we saw that it is prime. Um, therefore, p cannot divide uh, this thing either, it does not divide these two things. So, by Euclid's lemma, again, um, I mean, yeah, by Euclid's lemma, I don't know why he's referring to Euclid, Euclid's lemma though, it's just obvious. If you do not divide these two things, it cannot divide this as a prime. Um, now, if the order of p is uh, like p to the k, those like you know you have some k that is less than the actual exponent e. Um, so uh, the index of p is going to be um, order of g over order of p, right? Order of g we know is p to the m. Order of p is p to the k. So we assume that to be the case. Um, that is equal to um, p to the e minus km, uh, but p does not divide uh, this thing either, uh, so k has to be equal to e, because um, uh, the only cases, um, because p does not divide this thing, so um, you have to like blow this p to the e minus k whole thing out, and um, the only way to do that is um, assuming k is equal to e, right? So you have um, you're left with m and we already know that um, p does not divide m right so that works out so that was the um, second um, silo um, theorem we have another one no wait Right, so yeah, that's the thing. Um, we saw, uh, yeah, Rotman did all of this. Uh, right, so he first did the second Sewell theorem in Arten. Um, then we did the third one right now about P to the EM. And the first one was just, uh, um, yeah, the first one was quite straightforward. Okay, so this, uh, I'm not sure about how Artin proves all this. Uh, I believe he does it um, through his way of, um, I mean, I believe it's going to be interesting. But uh, Rotman did it um, in a much more, I guess, abstract way using the normalizer and uh, the um, index um, itself. So, yeah. Um, then yes, yeah, so yeah, Rodman uh, on page two seventy two, he says he's giving now going to give a second proof of what's basically Zeno theorem number one. Yeah, uh, theorem five point three eight. So that's the proof that Artin uses. Mm -hmm. So okay. he gives this alternate proof rather than the one that Rotman gave. Rotman has built up all this machinery with the normalizer. Mm -hmm. So he's he's going to do it that way. Yeah, and I believe um, this normalizer, building up the normalizer, is a good idea. Um, I mean, I mean at, at least it looks pretty clean to me. <laughs> um, this second proof. Um, Mm-hmm. 
So this is by Wilden, Wieland, Wieland. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Artin does it exactly the same way, okay. Mm-hmm, looks like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, do we need to go to the second theorem, sorry, second proof? Um, I don't think so. Right, for the next three pages, is going to, um, give corollaries and examples of the theorems we saw. Okay, so this theorem, uh, sorry, this proposition looks important. Um, a finite group um, whose uh, silo subgroups are normal, right, so all of these silo subgroups are normal subgroups, uh, then that finite group is going to be the direct product of its um, silo subgroups, right? Okay, and this is, uh, I believe, you know, you can. Uh, Okay, so you know the proof looks pretty uh, decent to me. Uh, you have the order of G. Uh, you have the prime decomposition. Now um, you take one of those primes. You have a uh, silo subgroup from there. So G P I is the silo P I subgroup of G. Now exercise five point one on page two sixty seven. All right. So um, okay. So we, ah, this is interesting. So. If you remember, we did uh, the um, proposition 5.4. What was proposition 5.4? It was something related to uh, uh, having the sum of um, cyclic subgroups, right? The direct sum, okay. And 267. Mm-hmm, the first exercise. Okay, so... Hmm. So what it's going to do, I believe, uh, is... The... Direct product, right? The direct sum of all the, um... Cyclic subgroups generated from these, uh, silo stuff, right? So the subgroup S generated by all silo subgroups is um, G, right? Okay, so the subgroup that you're going to generate by silo subgroups is going to be the whole subgroup, the whole group itself, um, because everything that you're cre creating the silo groups from are like the um, prime factors of the order of um, G. Right, so what that means is that the order of S uh, is going to be um, um, divisible by each of these um, prime factors because you're generating from these uh, silo uh, subgroups, which are like you're generating from like each of the primes, right? So each of them are going to divide the uh, order of S. Um, finally, if you take X to be in this thing, ah. Uh, so this is, uh, if you remember what we did on direct sums, you know, you take um, this, um, you have the sum, the direct sum, and then you take one of those things out, um, one of the summons out, and then you intersect with the rest of the sum. So this is GPI intersected with um, the uh, rest of the um, silo subgroups that you're left with. 
So this j is not equal to y. So j is not equal to i means um, you know your GPI is excluded from this union. Now, um, so if x is something in here, then x is equal to s i, uh, which is like an element of the uh, silo p i subgroup G P I. Then x can be written as uh, right because it's in the intersection, so x is also included in here. So x can be written as the product of all the sj's from all the rest of the silo subgroups. So remember, here you're taking all the silo subgroups except this one. So as x is going to be an element of this, so um, x can be written can be represented as the product of all the elements from the um, whatever you're having here right so that's that you don't think so sorry JP um, not sure I understand you so that was from earlier when you asked okay. whether we need to go through the second proof of the silo theorem <laughs> okay yeah I mean uh, that was uh, I don't know looks um, more computational to me <laughs> um, somehow it's I'm really not... good and yeah it seems to be a standard proof when I look around mm-hmm but that's the one that I mentioned where you have to consider different groups working on different sets. And yeah. it's a kind of a pencil and paper thing to keep track of what group action on what set you're talking about. Yeah, makes, makes sense. Okay, so yeah, I think uh, it's a good idea to go through this proof for this silo theorem. And then from uh, Artin, you said it's basically the same, but I'm interested about Hungerford or what he does. Um, does Hungerford do something similar? Hungerford uses um, the same proof that Rotman gave first. Okay. Only he proves something a little bit more general. Instead of just showing that there's a, um, a subgroup, a P subgroup of order P to the E, he shows that there's a, a P subgroup of order P to the first, P to the second, all the way up to P to the E. So he's got an induction in there. Mmm, looks nice. Yeah, there, there it is. Yeah, this one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess, I mean, you expect Rotman to do something like this. <laughs> Induction. Um, so, slow P subgroups always exist, though they may be trivial. Every P subgroup is contained in a slow P subgroup. Okay, you can use the zone lemma for that. You know, you have the chain of uh, P subgroups. The maximal one is going to be the slow one. Um, and it's going to contain all the other P subgroups. Okay, yeah. So I didn't follow that. Why do we need to use Zorn's lemma on a finite group? Um, because... We don't have any infinite chains of subgroups in a finite group. The chain has to terminate just because okay, he said, <laughs> the group has finite that, order. That's for infinite groups, yeah, he says. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's continue with uh, whatever we were doing. Um, so x can be represented as the product of these um, elements from the rest of the um, p subgroups that you're left with. Um, now, x to the pi to the n. Okay, so there's some n. So you're raising x to this uh, prime to some power n. Um, it gives you the identity. And I am not sure how that follows. Uh,
Mm. Okay, so you write so your uh the order of um sorry the 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 okay I'm not sure. Yeah, you just take some n such that you can have this, and I believe you can, and because um, x is in GPI, right? Uh, and GPI is a silo PI subgroup. Okay, right. We have the order, so you have the power there. That's that, that makes sense. Um, so that's uh, for some n you can have this. Then on the other hand, there is some power of p j. I said this here we were talking about p i. So p j uh, is like the uh, the rest of the primes. So there is some other power of p j. So q j. <laughs> this is confusing. Uh, we could have used like e j or something. I don't know. But q j uh, with s j to the power q j is gives you one. So s j is like all the elements in the rest of the p subgroups this is low piece of groups and you raise them to this power uh, some other power uh, qj and that gives you the identity one right now since sj commute with each other ah okay that's because right so um the direct sum uh, theorems that we saw that they work for a billion groups but this exercise says uh, proves that they do not they also work for non abelian groups um so um they're going to commute um what that means is that um one can be written as x to the q and uh okay and x is uh the product this so you raise this to power q and <laughs> q itself is a product of um, the QJs that you get from um, QJs are the powers of PJs, right? So this is confusing, um, but yeah, PJs are the primes of the rest of the silo P subgroups, um, and um, the GCD of um, PI uh, to the n um, with Q is going to be one because here you have like one exponent. And you have the other exponent, and both of them give you uh, one. So you know um, we'll have the GCD as one. So that is their relatively prime. Um, then you know using the whatever that was linear combination of the you know linear combination representation of the GCD, you can have integers u and v such that one is equal to u times uh, pi to the n plus v times q. Um, so now x is equal to um, you multiply this whole thing with x you'll get um, x to the u times p i n times v q because we know x to the q is 1 and x to the p i n is also 1 so this whole thing becomes 1 right so what that means is that um, x is equal to 1 so that's the only thing uh, in between uh, sorry that intersects this is the um, identity itself and that was what we needed for the direct product or direct sum theorem right if the intersection of whatever you're taking with respect to everything else uh, summed up is equal to the identity the, that's the only thing in common then uh, your direct uh, sum is well defined so therefore G is the direct product of its subgroups right? and this is uh, I believe a neat proposition which we're going to need later in the exercises. Okay. Um, um, let's see. We have a few lemmas. This proposition 5.41. Um, do you think like there was something to it? Um, he seems to work with some numbers. Kind of. I'm reluctant to that. But uh, is there something interesting there? Doesn't seem to me though. I think he just commented in the last section, whenever it was that we showed that 
A5 is a simple group. Was that mm. last Thursday? Yeah, that was uh, when we were doing he, the group actions, yeah. He made the claim that A5 was the smallest non-abelian yeah. simple group. Yep. And the proof had to wait till now. Mm. So okay. now he's coming back and filling in that. Yeah, I kind of didn't like, uh, to be honest, I don't like A and S as the symmetric groups or whatever. Um, but, um, I w yeah, I'd recommend checking out Artin. Yeah. Because he relates A5 to the symmetry group of the dodecahedron. Okay. So he get it's still not easy reading, but, um, it gives a much more concrete way of thinking about it than just in terms of the conjugate three cycles. Yeah. So. That's I think that in Galois theory, it's mm -hmm. a there you go. The fact that A five is central, or simple is important in proving the mm -hmm. that there's not a formula for solving the quintic. So yeah. I think that everybody wants to prove that A five is simple, and they just choose different ways to do it. And Artin does it very geometrically. Yeah, and that is kind of good. I believe I'll go to this then. Um, but cool, R10. I believe, I mean, most of the things that we've gone through from Rotman are also in this more group theory chapter of, um, R10. Um, yeah. So th there's this, um, book I I've been checking out. It's called Abel's Theorem. And I don't remember the full title, but part of the title was Sabal's Theorem. Okay. And it basically proves that it's a, it's a, it's a small book, uh, it's a short book, um, sort of trying to give a self-contained proof that um, quintic equations and equations of higher degree are not, um, in general, uh, solvable. And there is, uh, in this book, there is a proof that A5 um, is, is, is um, simple, I believe. Um, Using that uh, identification with the symmetries of a dodeca dodecahedron, so mm. maybe I can share that as well. Okay, that's nice. That will be very nice. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, is that like Abel's theorem in problems and solutions? Something from Arnold? Yeah, ah, uh, let me check. Okay. I think I have the book open. Mm. I think I heard that. Abel's that. theorems in problems and solutions. Yep. Okay. By Arnold. Yeah. Would be nice to check. Yeah, so this A5 is important. Okay, you would be would have to go through this from some other books. They have the um, dodecahedron on the cover. Hmm. Isn't it? Y yeah. Yep. <laughs> that says something. Does, does he also do Riemann surfaces in there? Or? I be I believe he does. Yeah. Yeah. That's something else I'd like to learn more about. I don't know where to start, but that's for a different conversation. Uh, I don't have much idea about complex analysis, but um, the Riemann surfaces are interesting. So th is this like a collection of lecture notes or like has just a problem book or something? Mm, okay, so this looks very um, kind of 
um, starting from elementary, I guess. Uh, he he doesn't assume much of knowledge. I mean, I guess he assumes some topology, topology when he goes to like renowned surfaces. But other than that, um, it's kind of self-contained. Yeah, as he was saying. Would be nice to take his first chapter is in groups. Yeah. It looks really good for self-study, Harn. I think there's got like a hundred pages of lessons and then another hundred pages giving hints and solutions. Yeah. It looks awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been meaning to um, read uh, more. I I kind of found it by accident. I don't I don't even remember where, but it, it's it's it seems like a lot of fun to work through the exercises. And also, it, it, it's sort of interesting that I mean, in the I think in the introduction, maybe he he talks about that the typical proof of that that equations of fifth degree and higher are not um, solvable um, involves Galois theory, um, and Galois theory gives some more general um, sort of more, more general techniques to solve other problems in mathematics as well. But he kind of dedicated the whole book to. Proving in the way that proving it in the way that Abel did, not the Galois. So and it's more geometric and uh, rather than algebraic. So that's sort of cool mm -hmm. as well. Nice. Maybe it would be a good thing to complement with when we go for um, Galois theory. Yeah. Okay, um, um, besides, we're left with, uh, the uni triangle, sorry, uni, yeah, uni triangle matrices. Um, let's see if we can go through this, uh, quite quickly. Um, I still don't get the big picture idea about, like, why he's doing this, but, um, let's see. A unitriangular matrix uh, over a field is an upper triangular matrix, each of whose diagonal terms is one, okay? Um, so UT of NK is uh, N by N unitriangular matrices over the field K. Mm-hmm, okay. So if K is a field, then uh, this uh, UT is going to be a subgroup of GL. Okay, so like if your general linear group generated from this field um, is going to be um, it's going to contain this unit triangular matrix. Okay, so all the unit triangular matrices are contained in this okay so um the identity is uh unit triangular yeah um if a is a unit triangular matrix then um a can be written as i plus some n so it's the identity plus some um strictly upper triangular matrix right okay So what that means is that n is an upper triangular matrix having only zeros on its diagonal. Okay, so when you add them, you're going to get um, a unit triangular matrix with diagonals um, uh, filled with ones. Um, the sum and product of uh, strictly upper triangular matrices is again a strictly upper triangular. Okay, that's from linear algebra. You take a basis of the field. Uh, it's the standard basis of k to the n. Um, now, if n is a strictly upper triangular matrix, then you define this T, which um, goes uh, from the field to the field, takes you from the basis um, to uh, n times the basis. Right? So n is strictly upper triangular, remember. Um, so what that uh, means is that uh, your um, hmm okay. 
Um, now t satisfies all the equations that is uh, t of e1 um, is 0 right and um, t of i plus 1 is equal to the cyclic group generated by i uh, e's right so our t2 is uh, going to be contained in uh, cyclic group generated by e1 and e2 right so that's how it works um if we apply induction then t i of e j is equal to zero for all the j's that are less than i right so this um directly comes from here but uh, if you apply induction um that should work it follows that t to the n is equal to zero. Um, if t to the n is equal to zero, then n to the n is also equal to zero, right? Now, if you have this uh, upper triangular matrix, sorry, unit triangular matrix, then um, a is equal to i plus n where n to the n is equal to zero so okay that makes sense um we have to see that it's a subgroup of g l n k um you have to define the multiplication so i plus n times i plus m is going to give you the identity plus n plus m plus n m um and the the right hand side ter the right hand side term is unit triangular because all of those are unit triangular n and m right so uh, we show that um, if a is unit triangular um, then it is non singular um, okay and that uh, as it's non singular it has an inverse and its inverse is also going to be unit triangular mm -hmm, okay so they do something like this um we know the power series expansion right um you have one plus x uh, inverse uh is equal to one minus x plus x squared minus x cubed dot dot, dot. um so you, they define the inverse of a similarly that's i plus n inverse uh is equal to b uh is equal to one minus n plus n squared dot dot, dot. Uh, um and this uh, must stop at n minus 1 because uh, we have shown that n to the n is just the 0 so you know, it cannot it terminate there um, now you have to check uh, that it is uh, well defined the inverse is well defined so ba is equal to give the identity and so is ab um, um, n is strictly upper triangular right so uh, apart from the identity you're left with all these terms minus n plus n squared minus n cubed up until n to the n minus one is uh, going to be also strictly upper triangular right so the inverse is um inner triangular right that's i uh, plus the upper triangle um yeah i mean you can like i you know just state this in terms of linear algebra as he says um that uh, as a is non-singular its determinant is one um the formula for a inverse uh, i remember how to find the formula for me sorry the inverse of a matrix the adjoint cofactors and whatnot i hate it <laughs> um it shows that um a inverse is going to be in triangular right that's uh your um uh, everything that you need for a subgroup is well defined so it's a subgroup okay now what is it doing with this unit triangular stuff Mm hmm saying that the sum of a unit and the important elements is a unit <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds a lot like that 
I think that his goal for this is theorems 547 and the corollary right after it. So I guess we might look forward to see what the, those theorems say to decide how deep we want to go into it. If P is a prime and Q is equal to P to the M, then the unit triangular group generated by UT and the field of Q elements is a silo P subgroup of DL. Ah, okay. This feels like just stating things in terms of like specific matrices. I mean, So whereas other authors of introductory books are just going to say, okay, let's find all groups of order 24 <laughs> something by looking at the CELO subgroups, he's trying to give an, an interesting use of CELO subgroups yeah. in some non-abelian group. Yeah, not using numbers, I some, see. Yeah. Okay, maybe we should go through this. Uh... The proofs, um, let's see. Um, okay. So we're done until this, right? So this proposition directly says that if Q is some um, power of P, where P is a prime, then for each um, N greater than or equal to 2, greater than 2, the unit triangular matrix that you get by hmm the unit triangular matrices uh, n by n unit triangular matrices that you get from uh, the q uh, sorry from a field of q elements um, is going to be a p group okay so i think the path seems quite um, straight to me in the sense he's first going to show that it's a p group then uh, he'll do some other stuff and then you know um, he's going to show that uh, this p group is maximal uh, or something like that then it's going to be a solo p group or something okay let's see um, so this uh, set of unit triangular matrices is a p group of order q to the n or sorry q to the um, um, n c two um, and that is equal to q to the n times n minus one which is that's, that's the um, combination formula right um, the number of entries in a n by n unit triangular matrix lying strictly above the diagonal so above the diagonal um, is going to be um right um c n two that is um n times n minus one over two okay mm, right so you have like n square entries and um like you cut out the diagonal the diagonal has n terms sorry n entries so that is n square minus n and you're just considering the upper half of the diagonal so that's n square minus n over 2 um, now each of these entries can be uh, any element of the field um, that you have um, so there are exactly exactly okay there are exactly this many triangular unit triangular matrices over the field of q elements right Hmm. Okay, right. That that means um, you know you have the unit triangular matrices and the everything you have on the um um the entries that you have are, are like elements of F Q. Um, thus, you know the number of unit triangular matrices that you have is equal to the number of entries you have above the diagonal sign, and that is uh, q to the n uh, square minus n over 2 um, this so okay that makes sense and this uh, 
exercise. I think we've done this before. That if you have a G as a group and you know the inverses are the elements themselves, uh, then G is abelian. Yeah, we know that. Um, and I think we've done also this. If G has like an order prime order, um, P is an odd prime, then it also is abelian. Okay. The proposition here says that if P is an odd prime, then there exists a non-abelian group G of order P cubed with x to the P is equal to 1 um, for all x and G. Okay. There exists a non-abelian group G. Yeah, he could have just said that this UT3 is non-abelian and it satisfies this, but he's going to say that there exists something and then say that UT is that one. Okay. So uh, if G is your um, three by three unitangular unitriangular matrices over um, F P, then uh, the order of G is going to be P cubed, right? Um, now G is not a million, right? Uh, because if we have these um, these two um, unitriangular matrices. Um, then uh, they do not commute, right? If you multiply this with this and then the other way, you're going to get different products. Now, if you have some element of G that is it's a unit triangular matrix, and then A can be written as identity plus some upper triangular matrix N, uh, then since P is an odd prime, right? So P cannot be 2, uh, so N to the P. Um, is equal to zero, like just like we had n to the n is equal to zero. So the set of all matrices of the form uh, like this. So you have like this uh, linear combination of elements from the field plus these um, 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 plus these upper triangular matrices and up until n to the m and um, yeah. So and this is a uh, commutative ring okay it's a commutative ring that makes sense um, in which PM is equal to zero okay but our previous proposition 3.2 ah so 3.2, I think chapter 3 was about rings. Um, says something about binomial theorem uh, and commutative rings. Yeah, we haven't seen that, I guess. We saw um, stuff. Um, okay, I think. Yeah. But uh, P must divide um, NCP1, right? This is the um, permutation. Um, when i is less than p, and uh, now by proposition 1.1 is gone. This, like, he refers to propositions as if like this isn't a paper. You can just like turn the paper and go to the proposition, and um, but yeah. So this by this proposition you can write um, a p is equal to one plus n p. So this is directly from the binomial theorem, I believe. Um, i plus n to the p is equal to i p plus n to the p. And that is equal to identity itself, right? Because n to the p is zero. So um, I guess we're getting closer to where he wants us to get. Um, so you're um, you have this. Then he says uh, this theorem where this field with q elements. Um, uh, if you have this uh, finite field, then the order of G L. Uh, the general linear group on this field um, is going to be equal to this. So we have q n minus one times q n minus q. Okay, it goes on. You know, the power of q increases uh, up until n minus one. Looks pretty nice. Um, the proof is uh, you take a vector space, n-dimensional vector space, over the same field. Um, uh okay you have the vector space you have a bijection going from the general linear group to a basis no it's not a basis it's the set of all bases of 
the vector space. Okay. So for each entry in this general linear group, right? So like no, sorry. For each um matrix in this general linear group, remember how matrices look like in general linear group, um you're going to get a basis of this vector space, right? So that's an n dimensional vector space. So choose um this basis um of n elements of the vector space. Now if T is some matrix in GL, uh then this bijection um gives you um this and that's fair. Um by lemma three point one zero three three point one zero three. I'll have to see what that size. Mm, three point one three sorry one zero three three point one zero three that's on Page hundred and seventy seven. Okay. Um, you have a linear transformation, and if um, this T is a non singular, then for every basis you take for this vector space B, sorry, V, uh, T of X is going to give you. Okay, so okay, so T of X is going to give you this, which is going to be a basis of uh, this other vector space W. That makes sense. I mean, if you've done linear algebra, that's one of the trivial things, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it 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 directly follows from um, the fact that X is uh, linearly independent of uh, the basis. You know. Um. Okay, so that. So um, this, uh, whatever you get, uh, is also going to be a basis uh, um, a basis, and thus it's going to be in this set B, right? because uh, B is a set of all bases. So it takes a basis uh, to a basis, yeah. Uh, phi is a bijection, uh, so for a given basis, there is a unique linear transformation as uh, necessarily non singular, yeah, as we saw in the last uh, lemma, uh, such that S times the basis of V gives you these V's. Um, okay. All right, so it gives you again a basis of uh, V. Um, so if we count the number of bases of V, um, what you're going to do is um, you'll have to see. Hmm. You have. Hmm. Okay, you have this uh, n-dimensional vector space member. Your field has q elements. You have q to the n vectors in V. Okay, um, that makes sense. So there are q to the n minus one, q to the n minus one candidates for V one. Um, that is not the zero vector. Okay. Um, Okay, so you're going to like choose what can be v1 and what can be v2, and then okay, you continue. So having chosen v1, uh, what you're left with um, the candidates for v2 are those vectors that are not uh, in the uh, subspace generated by v1, right? The subspace spanned by v1. Uh, so then uh, the subspace spanned by v1 is going to have 
Um, hmm. All right, so um, it's going to have Q elements, so that'll be uh, Q to the N minus Q candidates for V2, and thus you repeat. So when you repeat, you're going to um, increase the powers of Q in here because uh, V1, V2, and you know it's going to increase. Um, so if you have a linearly independent list of these V's, then V i plus one is going to be, um, you know, is going to be containing vectors that are not in the um, subspace spanned by these vectors, V i's vectors, right? Okay, so that was um, this, and then you complete uh, this, you know, by induction repeatedly, and uh, you're going to be left with this. And what he's going to do with this is that uh, you have the theorem next theorem which says if p is a prime and uh, q is some power of p, then the unit triangular group uh, containing these unit triangular matrices is going to be silo p sub group, and that's that makes sense because if you think about it. Um, like this order of GL, GL, and F, Q, whatever, um, is like uh, this, right? Now, for each Q, for each element in here, which will be like Q n minus Q i, that will be um, you know, Q. You can you can like take Q out, Q i out of it, and you're going to be left with this. Um, now, if you think about this. The highest power of the prime p, which will divide the order of this general linear group, is going to be um, is going to be q times q two times q three up until q n minus i. Right, because um, if you take q's out of uh, these parentheses, you're going to be left with um, q times um, um, q to the n minus one, uh, and um, that's going to be highest power of p that divides this. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah, as we saw on this, you know, this is exactly, um, um, sorry, the uh, order of the unit triangular group is this, um, as we've seen before, uh, so this order is equal to the highest power of P, that means it has to be a silo P subgroup, as we've seen before, how that works. And this corollary from there, which says that if P is a prime, G is a finite P group, then G is isomorphic to a subgroup of the unit triangle. Okay, then that I believe this is um, doable um, by considering, um, you know, the um, the vector space over a field, and then uh, trying to define. Um, uh, Trying to have like some kind of um, embedding of this um, unit triangular group um, within G, um, but yeah. So that was um, our lecture on silo um, subgroups and uh, silo theorems. And um, there are a bunch of theorems. Sorry, examples. Sorry, exercises. I'm lost. Um, some of them are interesting to do, others are um, for practice, I believe, these ones are with numbers, uh, I guess, something to do with the practices. Um, I believe I will have to do uh, more work with the A and the symmetric groups and, you know, the group action and stuff there, but, yeah. So, tomorrow we have the PISA discussion. Uh, discussing piece at five.
um, 3p set 6 um, on um, abelian groups and those things that we saw last week um, and then day after tomorrow we're going to see the Jordan Holder theorem another important theorem um, from group theory right so yeah great job you deserved a slightly easier day after last Thursday that was <laughs> rough yeah, okay yeah um, I believe modules uh, would not be though that rough but uh, we don't know uh, we're going from Hungerford and he seems to like uh, shy away from proofs and just give sketches um, you know, a lot of things for us to do yeah. Okay, so I'm about to post a noter over in the algebra part. Um, mm -hmm. I've been trying to figure out why I should care about the Jordan Holder theorem. Okay. Because Rotman's not necessarily good about motivating things. Yep. And I see that Dummett and Foote have a very short chapter on it where they put it into the context of what mathematicians have been working on like up to the 80s. So tell how this is plays into relatively recent research mm. and in fact instead of giving a proof of Jordan Holder they break it down into like six or seven exercises so if I have time tomorrow there you go I think starting with exercise six or so it's saying this isn't so hard prove it yourself so i think that i might read this section and at least try some of those exercises before i dive into rotman um, i'll put a reference over yeah. in the algebra channel that's nice i didn't see this yeah i just noticed that i've been looking through all my books trying to find something that would talk about why we would care about it okay that's nice good job but um, I do notice that the section of Rotman covers a lot of other stuff after Jordan Holder, yeah. including some stuff that looks fairly basic and probably important. Okay. So it has some advanced stuff, and then after that, some more basic stuff. Okay. Like commutator subgroups. It's like, what? <laughs> after all this, we're talking about commutator subgroups? But, so anyway, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll post a note. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Good, le good lesson today. Yep, we did several terms pretty neatly. I mean, Rotman wasn't that bad here. Okay, so um, see ya tomorrow. We have got um, a big piece to go through.